Well, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Vratislav Mesic from McGill. He, I will talk a little bit about this CD. So he leads the Network Neuroscience Lab and investigates how cognitive operations and complex behavior emerges from the connections and interactions among brain areas. So uh, he uses different techniques and different modalities, not only MRI, uh, like fMRI, diffusion, uh, EKG, MEG, and PET. So thanks, everyone, for coming. Please. Thank you so much. All right. Um, it's okay if I take off the mic. Yeah. All right. So, uh, hello. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Bratislav, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Eduardo, for the opportunity to, to be here and to speak. And um, I will tell you a little bit about some of the, the, the new work that we've been doing uh, in the lab, kind of a, a new direction for us. Um, and um, a lot of the things that will pop up here and there, I don't know who is attending that uh, other event in Guanajuato, but there'll be some tangential things that I'll mention and, and I'll go into uh, more depth in, in, um, in those talks as well. Um, I'm conscious of the fact that sometimes I cram things into slides that might be too small. Uh, for people in the back, please stop me, ask me if there are any questions, if I should expand on anything, and I'm very happy to do that. Um, okay, so um, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, this idea uh, of uh, taking uh, connectome models that we have already and superimposing uh, maps of neurotransmitter receptors and transporters, that's really uh, what we'll do. Uh, so just kind of to get us all on the same page, uh, we, our, our jumping off point always conceptually is the, this idea that we live in a very exciting era where we can map, image, and trace connection patterns in various um, animals and model organisms. We can do this in something as simple as the mouse, or C. elegans rather. We can do it in uh, mammals like the mouse, but most exciting for us, we can do this in the living human brain. So what used to be done with painstaking manual dissection in post-mortem tissue can now be done relatively automatically using techniques such as diffusion-weighted MRI that allow us to reconstruct the white matter fibers that interconnect different neural populations. And we can distill these data sets down into these intricate wiring diagrams that we call connectomes that tell us the probability that uh, brain areas are interconnected with one another and therefore how they may potentially exchange information in the form of electrical signals, but also how um, different molecules may propagate um, on these networks. Um, and uh, what my group uh, does particularly um, is uh, we study the link between brain structure and function. Um, so uh, this is a diagram for, uh, from a review we had a few years ago, and uh, the, the broad idea is this, the uh, anatomical connectivity that we get from diffusion MRI or track tracing or whatever um, is really the infrastructure that supports a myriad of elementary um, communication processes, so signaling events that take place between different pairs of brain areas and the superposition of many of these signaling events ultimately manifests as patterns of interregional covariance, covariance or, or covariance of interregional activity that you measure with fMRI, MEG, PET, and so on. So the idea is that we can empirically access structural connectivity and functional connectivity and we have to understand what links um, those two modalities. How does uh, the anatomy give rise to function? Um, what we know is that uh, this link is, uh, has proven uh, difficult to, to, uh, to actually grasp um, because we know, for instance, that uh, where, whereas all pairs of areas will display a functional connection, you can compute a correlation coefficient between all pairs of areas, not all of them will have an underlying structural connection, and those that do have an underlying structural connection will tend to display stronger functional connectivity. Um, if you actually correlate them, what you find is that there is a positive correlation between the two, so areas that display greater structural connectivity will display greater functional connectivity, uh, which is what we expect, but there's a hell of a lot of variance here in functional connectivity that we're not getting through simple structural connectivity. And the reason for that is that um, you can obviously have lots of polysynaptic communication taking place on this network, and so uh, comparing them one against the other directly is, um, is suboptimal. And um, uh, this is just to show that even the systems that we extract, so using things like uh, community detection or ICA or whatever, and structural connectivity will give us 
a, a particular set of communities uh, which do not map on very well to the functional communities or resting state networks that we get from resting state fMRI. Um, so uh, what uh, we've always thought is that our communication models and the methods that we need to relate structure and function should be better so that we can do this, attack this problem in a, in a more optimal way. But what we've, uh, and that's what I'll talk about in, in Guanajuato in, uh, in a lot more detail, but uh, the other part of this equation is that we tend to think of the brain as just a, a, at a particular spatial scale, so these large gray matter nodes, and we tend to pretend that they're all the same. Uh, we know that's not true. Um, the brain is obviously a multi-scale system, starting from the uh, strong uh, gradients of gene expression and transcription that you observe that uh, dictate exactly where different neurotransmitter receptors will be situated, that in turn allow um, different types of relationships and communication between, between uh, through synapses um, that allow then different cell types to communicate with one another that then we ultimately end up trying to measure with diffusion-weighted MRI. Um, and with functional connectivity, we're obviously looking at things like blood flow and uh, the relationship between um, our, our um, hemodynamic and, and um, our oxygen and deoxygenated blood. And then we l use that to, to make inferences about whether the person is engaging in some cognitive task or combinations of cognitive tasks. Um, so the idea is that uh, we've lived for a very long time on the end of the spectrum, and we've really been ignoring uh, what happens at the more mi uh, microscopic level. And by we, I mean people in brain imaging, obviously. People in neurobiology know this very well. Uh, so the, uh, what I'll tell you, uh, we've, we've done work to relate all of these levels to, uh, to this problem, but I'll focus specifically on neurotransmitter receptors. And so just like a brief recap, uh, I'm not saying anything that nobody knows, but uh, you can, what typically happens is you can have a receptor, a ligand binds to it, the receptor opens up, and then you have flow of ions in or out of the cell that can cause um, a variety of um, uh, electrical changes. Um, uh, you can have ionotropic receptors that are relatively fast, or you can have metabotropic receptors where um, ligand will bind, uh, and uh, you can have, a, for instance, a, a, a G-coupled G uh, receptor that then has some downstream effect, and that can, again, cause uh, channels to open up or close. And this can so these uh, neurotransmitter receptor, uh, neurotransmitters, depending on the receptor that you have, can cause uh, fast or slow changes. They can cause um, ions to uh, move in or ions to move to flow out. Um, they can also cause uh, receptors to open or receptors to close. And so as a result, I think it's going to be, a lot of what I'm going to say in this talk will at the end of the day not be too surprising, um, but hopefully the way that we get there will be interesting. Um, that the neurotransmitter receptors are therefore going to be key modulators of firing rates and therefore they're going to really shape patterns of interregional signaling and dynamics. Um, so uh, the idea that this, the one way in, this which, in which this could work, uh, this is something that, that we talked about in a recent review where you, know, you could have these uh, you know, ascending projections say from the brain stem and depending on what type of, you still have the same structural network throughout, but depending on what type of projections are being used and what type of receptors are situated and where they are, you could induce different types of functional configurations. You can have a situation, for instance, where you uh, promote signaling among densely interconnected neighbors, so you have more kind of a segregated um, uh, signal exchange, or you could uh, have a situation where these uh, projections promote more integration, cross uh, crosstalk between uh, brain areas that belong to separate systems. Um, so just again, getting at, the, at this idea of how neurotransmitter receptors could influence the relationship between structure and function. So uh, what we wanted to do was to um, look at neurotransmitter receptors, which can obviously be measured with positron emission tomography. Um, typically, though, what happens is, um, at least in our experience, you have a study where a person is interested in a particular um, clinical population. They have one particular tracer that they're really interested in, and they have some control group, but very rarely for cost and also ethical reasons is it 
uh, common to have multiple tracers being applied to the same person. Um, so, uh, but this was about uh, just under two years ago, we started to cold call uh, people that we knew. We first started in our local uh, imaging center where we have a, a both a cyclotron um, to make uh, radio ligands but also uh, pet cameras. Uh, but then we eventually went to other people in Montreal and then across the world and we asked them if they'd be willing to share their pet data with us, just the control subject. We were not at the time interested in um, the associated clinical population and um, there was a period of a few months where we were literally in, in, in Zoom meetings all day long, but at the end we went and uh, managed to collect uh, data and a whole bunch of uh, uh, neurotransmitter systems and with many different receptors. And this is uh, what we have so far. Um, they uh, comprise about 1,200, just over 1,200 PET scans. We have 19 different uh, receptors and transporters with some, uh, some that can actually be measured. We also have some uh, additional backup uh, radio ligands that, that bind to, to some of them and, and they encompass about n uh, nine different neurotransmitter systems. And all of this is, uh, all of these maps and the code that we use to do this is uh, openly available. So we wanted to ask uh, how does network architecture interplay with these um, local annotations of different uh, neurotransmitter receptor density. Um, so we started, what I'm going to show you a lot is uh, an analysis that starts out like this where we would take a receptor uh, profile for a particular area and we would correlate it with a receptor profile for another area. So we would look at how similar are the receptor profiles of two areas. Do they speak the same language? Are they, um, are, are they potentially um, uh, likely to be influenced in a similar way, uh, say, by, from, by, by subcortical projections? And this gives us um, this um, uh, region by region receptor similarity matrix. You can already see that it has a nice community structure here. It's actually been ordered by the so-called uh, resting state networks. And um, so some sanity checks first. Um, this receptor profile um, similarity measure has an exponential drop off with spatial proximity. Uh, that's what's being shown here. So that means that the further away two areas are, the less likely they are to have similar receptors. We expect this, we, ex we see this in virtually any um, imaging modality and we also know it's uh, uh, a true biological uh, kind of feature of many of these um, attributes. Um, but we can also take data, uh, this is from the Human Connectome Project, we can take data on structural connectivity and functional connectivity, so diffusion weighted MRI and resting state fMRI. And we can ask whether Areas that are physically connected tend to have greater similarity, uh, they do. And uh, areas that are part of the same resting state network, do they also tend to have more similar receptor profiles than they do? So what this means is that um, if you're physically connected to someone or you're participating in a similar cognitive function, you tend to have similar receptor profile distribution. And this is just kind of taking these two quantities and actually correlating them directly as well with uh, with structural and functional connectivity weights. You see that they're positively correlated as expected. So um, that's all well and good. Um, what do we know about what this uh, measure represents? Well, uh, one thing that you can do is you can take this receptor profile similarity, you can project it to a low dimensional space. You kind of have a, a dominant gradient of um, uh, where on one end of the axis you have areas that are similar to each other in terms of their receptor profiles and then you have a, a smooth transition to the other end of the axis where different sets of areas are similar to each other. This receptor gradient, if you stratify these areas by their membership, for instance, in the different cytoarchitectonic classes that were um, uh, drawn out by Mesalem based on, based on, on site architecture, you see a, a nice um, a, a nice kind of uh, continuous axis from paralympic areas down to idiotypic areas. And one thing that uh, we had access to, it's not a PET tracer for neurotransmitter receptors. Um, it's called UCBJ, and it's, it's my favorite PET tracer. It's a PET tracer that's uh, sensitive to synapse density. Um, so you can see that um, this axis actually really nicely outlines uh, synaptic density in the brain. Um, and now, moving on to the, the question, that w the, the, the whole reason we started this in the first place was, can we get a sense of um, structure-function coupling 
or, 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 or see it, from, look at it from a different perspective now that we have this um, data resource. So what I'm going to show you here, um, this is a, a map of how similar um, structure and, structural and functional connectivity is for different brain areas. Uh, I apologize for the way that the, the, uh, the color axis is, but it's a replication. Uh, you can see over there, that's the paper where we originally looked at this. Um, it's, it's literally a map that runs from unimodal cortex to transmodal cortex. In, in primary visual cortex and somatomotor cortex, you have very strong concordance between structural connectivity and functional connectivity, and in transmodal cortex, you have less. I'll talk about this in Guanajuato in a lot more detail. Um, we said, okay, well, this is, what we, this is what we get, how well we can predict functional connectivity if we only use structural connectivity. And what we're going to look at is how well can we uh, predict functional connectivity if we use structural connectivity plus receptor profile similarity? Can it help us to augment structure function coupling? And that's what you can see here. The, the, the straight line is identity. So everything is going to be, everything is above it and the uh, points in, in, in yellow are uh, uh, statistically significant. So for most brain areas we have an augmentation of structure function coupling um, when, uh, when we include receptor profile similarity. Um, and in case anybody's interested, these are the areas that benefit most from including this information. This could be because in these areas, um, the receptor profiles are particularly important. It could be that in these areas, structural uh, Im diffusion imaging or, or resting state fMRI have greater signal to noise or are somehow compromised. And so we're just helping them to um, uh, we're, we're, uh, we're kind of filling in the gaps that we had uh, before. So that, that's kind of um, not, not clear, but uh, what we do know is we can drastically improve prediction of function from structure if we include information about neurotransmitter receptor profiles. Um, okay, so one thing that you would have noticed maybe uh, <laughs> in a lot of these is that a lot of my p-values have a little spin under there. Uh, so what we're doing here is every time I engage in comparing two brain maps, um, I am comparing two sets of points um, or, that are not independent because they all come from they all come from the brain, which has some spatial autocorrelation. Um, so what we're doing is we're using a, rather than just you looking up um, the the, the T value in the, in the analytical distribution that you have for your Pearson's R, uh, we're using a permutation test that's called a spin test where you take, in our case, what we're doing is we're taking the annotations for different nodes, we're projecting them to a sphere, and we're ro randomly rotating that sphere and bringing it back to the cortex. So you end up with something like this. So what we, and we do this for only one map so that we can create a, null, a distribution of correlation coefficients under the null hypothesis that um, spatial autocorrelation does not drive the observed relationships between two brain maps. I'll talk about this in my second talk in Guanajuato a lot. Uh, but there is a, uh, we did do a, a Frantisek Vasha and I did a, a, do a, a review on this recently. So in case anyone's interested. Anyway, just, just so you know, uh, we're now just running around doing uh, <laughs> naive uh, correlations. All right. So some other things that we would have expected to see with receptor profiles. One is uh, we tend to spend a lot of our time in MRI land, uh, but uh, we really like using uh, electrophysiology. So uh, what we did was to take the uh, MEG data from the Human Connectome Project and derive a series of maps uh, of the different canonical um, electrophysiological -physio frequency bands. So, um, uh, theta, delta, alpha, beta, gamma. And uh, what I'm going to be showing you now is we're going to take a map of MEG power and we're going to ask, can we do a multiple regression where we take all the different neurotransmitter maps and find some linear combination of them that predicts this map? Is there some mixing of receptor profiles that I can use to predict this uh, ma electrophysiological map. You're going to be seeing two things. You're going to be seeing a, um, um, an, an adjusted R squared. And um, you're also going to be seeing um, the result of what is called a dominance analysis. This is just a really fancy kind of hierarchical regression. Actually, not fancy, but really cool, very simple, and something that we really like. 
uh, where you try out different combinations of predictors in your linear model so that you can um, assign dominance, which, which this row, the values in that row add up to one. And you can say exactly which uh, predictor makes the greatest contribution. So I'm going to ask two questions. Can I predict oscillatory power from my receptor maps? And two, which receptors make the largest contribution to this? Um, so that's what you have here. Um, the cool thing is that we tend to do uh, pretty well for, actually, for all of them, except for high gamma. Um, we, um, uh, we, we, all, we find, um, so, so some good news, bad news. We find that uh, things like mu opioid receptor, which has been uh, shown time and time again to be important for a lot of these oscillations, uh, we see that as a, as a dominant predictor. We also see um, some faster ionotropic receptors, such as the, uh, I always forget, it's the alpha 4 beta 2, I think, uh, norgenergic receptor. Um, um, some bad news, we would have thought to see that uh, NMDA and GABA would uh, make a contribution here. We don't. Everything that I'm showing you, if you look at the paper, we actually replicated in autoradiography. And uh, the cool thing about that autoradiography data set from Ulich is that they um, actually had a slightly different set of neurotransmitter receptors. And what we found there was that um, AMPA uh, receptors, for instance, would, um, uh, were, were good predictors. Um, but the, the, the bigger picture here, here is that we can get very, very good uh, prediction of oscillatory dynam dynamics just from, or regional differences in oscillatory power just based on uh, receptor maps. Um, so next thing, uh, we, we have uh, structure and function, we have uh, dynamics. Uh, we thought, what about uh, the extent to which different brain areas participate in different cognitive functions? So what we did here was to take the, uh, use a, a, a technique called partial least squares or PLS analysis that's um, very similar to a canonical correlation. Uh, we can talk about this actually um, um, if anybody's interested. Uh, and what we're doing is we're taking two data matrices, one that's different regions by receptor, so all of our receptor maps on one end, and we're taking different regions and their um, activation um, in, for different neurosynth terms. For people that don't know, neurosynth is a wonderful, a wonderful resource by, uh, made by Talia Arconi, who, where uh, it's a meta-analytic engine that goes through fMRI papers and looks at the probability that different brain areas are going to be reported as activated uh, in relation to different cognitive terms. So we have a winnow down list of uh, about 100 different cognitive terms and the probability that um, different brain areas are activated during those terms. Because what we want to know is um, are there some cognitive terms that are associated with some patterns of neurotransmitter profiles? And what PLS is going to do is it's going to find um, a combination of receptors and a combination of cognitive terms that optimally go together. That's what it's going to do. Okay, so we find this is, a, PLS is actually a singular value decomposition at its core, so what we have is a bunch of uh, latent variables. We are only, the first one has the largest effect size. It is only the, it is also the only one that's uh, significant and cross-validates. Um, these are the maps for the receptors and terms. They should be similar, they are supposed to be similar. Um, and the way to interpret this, so I, we, we can go into this, but we did a lot of extremely painful cross-validation for this. But the thing to, to look at is what are the cognitive terms and what are the receptors? And what you get here is essentially a gradient that runs from um, um, a lot of kind of motor, visual, skill planning imagery type stuff down to more <coughs> affective terms such as emotion, fear, valence, and so on. And the way to, and, and then these are the receptors that, that parallel this gradient. And what you're seeing is that on the, um, well, on the end where you have a lot of valence type terms and affect type terms, that's where you have a lot of dopaminergic, serotonergic um, receptors, which is kind of consistent with uh, what we think about their function. And on the other end, we have a lot of things that have to do with, um, with attention and, um, and uh, to some extent, arousal. 
Um, you have things like um, uh, an, an norgenergic receptors, which we think has to do, again, with, with arousal vigilance and so on. And uh, people like Max Schein have written extensively about this at the, in the context of macroscale networks. Um, so uh, yeah, so we, we, we have a, a, a gradient that separates um, these two classes of functions and seems to run parallel with our uh, receptor maps, and it's a very strong effect. Uh, the last thing that we did was to ask whether these uh, receptor maps tell us anything about vulnerability to different diseases. So uh, we use data from the Enigma Consortium. Um, this is, uh, uh, for those that don't know, a big data sharing consortium that has different kind of teams that collaborate on different diseases. I, I know Eduardo is uh, actually a, a big part of one of them. Um, and um, in our case, what we're looking at are 13 different psychiatric, neurological, and neurodevelopmental diseases. And uh, so it's a total about 21,000 patients and 26,000 controls. And uh, what they give you uh, is their T1 estimated cortical thickness. So um, how uh, th thicker or thinner is their brain, gray matter, relative to the controls. So th this, these are actually not just cortical thinning. It could be cortical thickening as well. And um, oh, this shouldn't have appeared yet, but <laughs> what we're doing is uh, these are our different uh, diseases. Uh, you can find your favorite disease here. Um, you're seeing, um, so first of all, one thing that I want to point out is that you're seeing asterisks where the fit is significant and no asterisks where they're not. Uh, where don't we find significant hits? We don't find it for uh, idiopathic generalized epilepsy. We don't also find it for schizotypy. Schizotypy obviously is not really a, a, a disease per se. It's more of a kind of a, a construct that, that you get out of a, a questionnaire. Um, and then these are the different, um, again, the different dominance terms for the different receptors. So um, again, kind of good, good news, bad news. For the most part, actually, we, uh, we find cool things that um, I think make some sense, such as uh, we see serotonin transporter being involved in things like bipolar, schizophrenia, OCD. We don't see it for depression, though, unfortunately. Uh, we see things that have been, um, that if you actually look at the literature, has appeared time and time again in different animal models and so on. So uh, one thing, for instance, is the histamine receptor for Parkinson's, as well as um, the, um, well, let me see, I, I mean, the, well, the mu opioid receptor for ADHD. Um, um, why don't we see, any, any dopamine hits for Parkinson's? Why don't we see uh, serotonin transporter for depression? Um, it could be just one of those things. <laughs> it could also be that, uh, you know, in the case of Parkinson's, we're only looking at cortex. We're not looking at subcortex. In the case of depression, maybe cortical thickness is not the feature to be looking at, the phenotype to be looking at. Maybe we should have been looking at functional connectivity. But as we uh, sometimes say in the lab, you, you live by enigma and you die by enigma. So this is a, it's a fantastic resource and we, we really like it, but uh, obviously the, the, some of these things can be pursued further. But the idea here is that what you have is kind of the, the first step in creating a, what we like to think of as a kind of a lookup table where you're no longer asking, is it this one favorite receptor of mine or this other favorite receptor of mine that contributes to a particular disease? You have kind of a, a weighted combination and you can start to think about either designing follow-up studies that test interesting hits that come up or designing therapies that are, involve combinations of receptor action that affect a particular disease. And you don't have to play this game for cortical thickness. You can play it for any other map that you produce with neuroimaging. Okay, uh, one last thing. This is uh, from, a, from a different uh, uh, paper, but uh, I think it was kind of uh, instructive as a kind of to tie up this neurotransmitter story. Uh, we recently did a study where um, we looked at, um, so we are very interested in how brain architecture su supports the propagation of different diseases. 
Uh, so we kind of live in that connectomics world. But at the same time, we're also interested in how well these different local molecular predictors do at, uh, at, predicting, at uh, conferring disease vulnerability. So we did uh, a project that we kind of thought of as a local molecular versus global connectomic death match, where we took all of the, uh, a lot of the different uh, molecular predictors that we had, including the, this first component of receptor similarity. Um, as well as different uh, network theoretic measures that we could get uh, for different brain areas. And we asked which ones are better at predicting um, these enigma cortical thing patterns. And the only reason I'm showing you this is just to say, first of all, the molecular predictors tend to do better, slightly better than the connectomic predictors. And uh, among the, the, the top two molecular predictors is this uh, receptor PC1, so this receptor gradient here. Um, which really just takes this really beautiful heterogeneity of you know the 19 receptors and condenses it down to just one map. Um, but the idea is again receptor. As I said, any, all, everything you're going to hear from me is things you could have guessed from textbook knowledge. Um, but uh, receptors clearly are important for disease, disease vulnerability. So just as an interim kind of summary of uh, these uh, receptors and how they act as as um, you know, ears and messengers, mes messengers and, and uh, for uh, the brain. What we what I've shown you is kind of a comprehensive, I, but a ever growing and uh, openly available atlas of uh, uh, of chemo architecture. Um, I've shown you that these receptor profiles tend to align with synapse density, with structural connectivity, functional connectivity. Um, they shape oscillatory neural dynamics and um, they kind of outline this gradient that seems to run parallel to this dominant gradient of cognitive specialization. And uh, we have what we think is kind of an initial potentially lookup table that relates disease vulnerability to receptor um, profiles. Um, now, everything that I've shown you so far kind of revolved around, you know, building this tool with or by this data set with lots of different maps. Um, how do we make these maps useful, not just for us, but for other people that might be interested in using them? Um, oh, nope, sorry, that's not what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> okay, okay. I didn't even read it. Okay, one, one uh, little uh, vignette. Uh, one way that we use this atlas is, uh, well, in the lab, what we're really interested in is how different diseases spread on brain networks as well. And that often comes down to the question of what's the local molecular vulnerability. One disease that we study in particular a lot is Parkinson's disease, which is a synuclinopathy. And just like other neurodegenerative diseases, what you get is uh, normal proteins that, for whatever reason, uh, become misfolded. Then they spread transsynaptically and cause cell death post uh, both presynaptically and postsynaptically. Um, so what we've been doing is a lot of models where we take structural connectivity and try to predict atrophy patterns by simulating the spread of these uh, misfolded proteins together with some measure of local vulnerability such as gene expression and trying to simulate patterns of atrophy. This is the, uh, a paper from Ing Chu uh, who was in our group at the time. Um, and we've taken this kind of way of thinking and done it for other things like schizophrenia. We've done it for FTD and then this paper that I just showed you um, looking at different diseases uh, from Enigma. Uh, what we always wanted to do was, because we're looking at proteins, we always wanted to, we were always tempted to use uh, data from the Allen Human Brain Atlas as a proxy. We always wanted to take gene expression patterns and say, different levels of gene expression are going to be correlated to different levels of protein abundance, and then I could make these models a lot more vertical. Um, and there, people have been doing this in the, in the literature for the, over the last few years uh, since the Allen Human Brain Atlas has been released. Uh, numerous high-profile papers by some of our uh, collaborators or scientific heroes have uh, made different types of models and just done different empirical analyses where they take the Ellen Atlas, they take gene expression and they say, I'm going to use gene expression of a particular um, gene as a proxy for the level of protein of the, you know, the protein that that gene codes for. The only thing that kept us from doing this is we thought, well, uh, there's a lot of steps that need to take place before, as you go from gene expression to protein level. Um, you think about there's translation um, and different errors that abound on transcription, sorry, and translation. 
Um, there's protein folding, you're stuffing it into a membrane, and if you have multimeric um, uh, receptors, you know, four or five plus subunits, you need to assemble them all in the membrane. So as a result, uh, you might not necessarily get a good link between gene expression, gene transcription, and protein level. Um, so we looked at this. Now that we had this PET uh, receptor map we, and transporter map, we could actually say for these 19 different proteins, can we, uh, do we see a good relationship between gene expression and uh, transcription? Um, so in other words, is this assumption of gene expression being a proxy for protein abundance, is this assumption correct? As an aside, around, uh, in parallel, we developed this tool that we call Abigen that actually allows you to work with the Allen Human Brain Atlas. It's a really simple Python toolbox that will download the data set for you. It'll process it. Yeah, actually, it can be done with one line of code, which you see up there. Um, it'll work with um, different uh, volumetric and surface atlases. You can do um, dense interpolation, ROI type stuff. Um, you can work with all the donors or with just specific donors from the data set. Anything that you want, really, it'll do for you. It'll also, with the Desik and Kiliani Atlas, it takes about a minute. Um, it'll also work with the Allen Mouse Atlas as well. And uh, it will not cook you dinner, but it will write your method section for you. So depending on the different processing choices that you pick, it will actually put them in text, which you can then paste into your uh, paper. The, the idea here being is that we've all kind of gone in different ways with analyzing this data set. And uh, this is a way potentially to standardize and to have an idea of exactly who did what. Anyway, that's an aside. So in order to address this question of relating protein levels to gene expression, we used our uh, tool to look at gene expression. And we used this data set of receptors to do this. So what you're going to see, this is not going to be very um, Fancy, you can see a bunch of scatter plots. On the y axis, you have gene expression for different uh, receptor proteins. And then on the x axis, you have receptor density from the PET maps that we have. Um, so that's what you're seeing there. In blue are the ones that are not statistically significant, and yellow are the ones that are. Sometimes they are statistically significant, but the big picture is most of the time they're actually not. There's not a good spatial correspondence between the two. We see this. Um, with uh, our PET data, we see it with autoradiography. We see it with uh, the Allen Atlas has RNA -se sequencing as well. So we see it with RNA seq. Uh, we see it with many other different uh, processing choices for um, for the Allen Human Brain Atlas. We see it in subcortex, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in other words, uh, people should really use extreme caution when making this assumption that you can just substitute in protein levels. You can substitute in gene expression for protein levels. Um, what could be driving this? Well, part of the, part of the equation is uh, just inter-individual variability. Um, so what you're looking at here, what you're going to see here, is on the y-axis is you're going to see differential stability of different genes. So this is a measure of how consistently the gene, how consistent are the gene expression values across the six donors in the data set. And um, on the y-axis is the correlation that we see between gene expression and receptor density. And what you see is a really nice positive correlation. What that means is that the greater the differential stability in a gene, in other words, the more consistent it is across donors, the better this correlation becomes. So, um, Sorry, uh, what yes. do you mean by differential stability? Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a measure of, uh, like, literally just uh, how uh, wide the distribution is of, the, of, the, of that value across the six donors. Yeah. Um, so what that means is that definitely there's a case to be made, and th this is something that people have been doing uh, for a very long time, is maybe thresholding um, which genes we use and focusing only on the ones that have high differential stability. There's other, obviously, reasons that this could happen. We talked about this protein buffering, splicing, you know, different gene isoforms, and so on. Um, so both of those things are at play, probably. Um, all right, that's that. Now, the last thing, what I started to talk about, uh, is uh, so how do we make all this uh, available and useful for people, gene expression, receptor maps, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we've developed a tool that we call Neuromaps. 
which is a very, again, a very simple, very lightweight um, tool that um, kind of will allow you to integrate brain maps from different imaging modalities um, and uh, have them all in one place and have you compare them. So we think of it as kind of like a Google Maps for the brain. Um, so, you know, what I've shown you are just very small example snippets of how different uh, both technological and data sharing advances have given us lots and lots of different reference maps um, to, to talk about brain structure and function. Um, uh, but these maps are actually all coming in different uh, coordinate systems, as I'm sure some of you are aware. Uh, they're very difficult to compare, and uh, also if you do compare them, you, as I briefly alluded to, you can't just use a very naive correlation. You have to control for spatial autocorrelation. Um, what was happening a lot in our work is we'd have a map of like, uh, you know, a case control contrast of cortical thinning, and we wanted to know what cell types are involved. Or we had a map of activation of a particular task from fMRI, and we wanted to know uh, were these areas enriched for some gene or something like this. Uh, then we'd get on the horn and we'd start emailing people frantically that we knew who had different maps and we'd try to bring them together. We never knew whether that was in the original space or not. Um, so how do we make this whole process more standardized? Um, now, uh, in adjacent fields that are not so different from us, such as genomics, microbiomics, metabolomics, and so on, um, this is actually a very common workflow. There exist tools and ontologies where you bring in a gene of interest or um, some other readout and you uh, compare it to a living data set that's continuously updated to get uh, structural and functional enrichment. Um, and so we wanted to do something like this, this is the, the famous G profiler, but there are many others like SAFE and so on. Um, so uh, we came up with this toolbox that we call NeuroMaps. I'm just going to give you the skeleton right now. The idea is you bring in a map of your own. I mean, you don't have to do any of these steps in sequence, but you could do it like this. You bring in a map of your own. You can do any transformation that you like to any of the major uh, neuroimaging coordinate spaces. You then compare it to a library that we curate of different uh, brain um, structural and functional features. And we give you a whole suite of um, uh, spatial autocorrelation preserving null models to make comparisons. And then you can get some enrichment uh, readout at the end. Uh, so I'll take you through some of these components first. First, the library. Everybody wants to know about the library. Uh, we have uh, things from um, MRI and, and others uh, and other techniques that we kind of broadly binned under microstructure, um, but including uh, stuff like the PET estimated synapse density um, and uh, T1-T2 ratio for intracortical myelin. We have uh, things to do with me metabolism from um, MRI and PET. Uh, glucose metabolism, oxygen metabolism, and so on. Glycolytic index from WashU. Uh, we have measures of cortical expansion. So these are kind of a, a little subfield where people compare how much different brain areas expanded in, um, in adult humans, either relative to primates or relative to, uh, to children. Um, we have measures of dynamics. So we have the different kind of oscillatory power maps from MEG. We actually also have it from um, intracranial EEG. And uh, we also have uh, measures that are from resting state fMRI, such as the, the famous kind of intrinsic time scale map. Uh, we have, uh, what do I have there? Oh yeah, we have uh, different layer thicknesses estimated from the um, big brain data set. This is kind of a histological atlas um, at, uh, at 100 micron resolution. And um, we also have cell types, different cell type maps that are estimated uh, using cell type deconvolution from the gene expression, um, um, Allen Human Brain Atlas. And of course, the, the centerpiece is, in a way is also the, 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 the receptor maps. Actually, what, are, what you're seeing, what you're gonna start seeing at the bottom is just how simple this is to run. It's usually just one or two lines of code. Um, and, um, we have a contribution pipeline, so we, we do our best to curate these things so that the maps that come in, they come in in their original native spaces. Um, but we do have a pipeline where you can easily upload something if you think is cool and we should include it. Um, the, probably the most useful part of the whole thing are the transforms that we've implemented. 
Um, we didn't make, we didn't invent these transforms. Other people, much smarter people than us did, but we have them all in one place. So the idea here is you, we support uh, the volumetric MNI 152 space, but we also support at the surface um, CIVET FS average and FSLR. Um, to go from volume to surface, we implement registration fusion. And uh, to go between the different surfaces, we have multimodal surface matching. Um, in our tests, these did extremely well, and that's why we um, included them. So what that means is that when you come in and you have a map in some space that, you've, that, you, are ha that you really like, but you know, the gene expression map is in a different space, we can help you to either take your map into, the, into that space or bring that other map into your space and you can easily kind of uh, traverse this. Um, the other thing that's actually very useful for people is we can we support parcellation just as easily. But we do like to work with the surface, with the dense kind of either vertex or voxel level data, um, at least when we have the library. Um, and then finally, we implement a suite of these different spatial nozzles. I don't want to kind of uh, bore you too much with this, but the idea is that you do not want to be doing naive models where you just use a Pearson's R and then the associated um, analytical uh, test. Uh, uh, what you want to be doing are these diff are different ways of projecting to a surface and spinning. Now, when we started to get into this work, uh, we noticed that at the time there were at least 10 different ways of doing this. Uh, so, uh, Ross Markelli, the, the reference is right there. We actually went and we had a paper where we benchmarked how well these different methods uh, controlled false positive rates. And that's what I'll talk about in Guanajuato as well. And so, these are so the so called spin tests. There is another class of spatial autocorrelation preserving nulls that uh, try to estimate, usually work by estimating the variogram in the data first, and then they try to generate. A, uh, a map that has uh, the same spatial autocorrelation as the map that you give it, and the, we implement those as well. Um, so when you put all of this thing together, all of these things together, is we provide you a set of different transformations, library that you can compare against, spatial nulls that will ensure that your p-values are not inflated, and then you get um, some enrichment score. So I'll show you just um, just as an example of what you might do. This is a uh, a map of uh, cortical thinning and schizophrenia from the NewStats data set that we submitted to NeuroMaps, and this is a map of um, evolutionary expansion um, uh, from uh, David Van Essen. And, uh, you know, we, we tra transformed um, this, uh, these maps to, to match, the, um, uh, to match the, the other maps in the library that we were comparing against, and we then got a score. So. Uh, for instance, uh, you see that um, in, um, in schizophrenia, you see a lot of hits for different um, um, allometric scaling maps, so different maps of uh, neurodevelopmental cortical expansion. We know that schizophrenia is neuro a neurodevelopmental disease, so areas that undergo the most rapid developmental expansion tend to be uh, the areas that this map is, is enriched for. Um, we see on, for the um, evolutionary expansion, we see things like um, uh, intersubject variability, which is cool because uh, as you start to, to get, you know, uh, a lot of, what, what we know is that a lot of these, uh, you know, you don't necessarily want a lot of intersubject variability in your, in how your motor cortex works and your visual cortex. You want it in, presumably that's going to be in transmodal cortex. You see hits like that anyway. Um, that's a little bit tangential, but the, the idea is that uh, this, this is potentially how you would use something like this, or you would use different components of the pipeline. Um, so it's, it's there, it's available, uh, it just, just came out, I think I had references for it, and um, yeah, I, th I, I think it's uh, sort of easy to use. Um, all right, so then just to kind of uh, wrap up, um, we, what I've shown you is this comprehensive and openly available site, uh, chemo architecture atlas. Um, I've shown you diff evidence uh, of, of things you probably didn't need to be convinced of, but uh, that receptor profiles align with brain structure, function, cognitive specialization, disease vulnerability, and so on. Um, this is only going to apply to a very small number of individuals who want to go down this road, but do exercise caution when using gene um, expression as a proxy for receptor profiles. Uh, and uh, finally, we've, uh, in order to make this kind of um, 
better for everyone, hopefully. We've come up with this uh, toolbox that allow you to take these maps and others as we make them available and, uh, and work with it. So uh, I just want to thank everyone who, who uh, was involved in this, especially Justine Hansen and Ross Markello, who did uh, a lot of the work, and, and uh, all the people that um, shared their pet data with us, uh, our funders. And I just want to thank you for your attention and looking forward to your questions. Oh, <laughs> I knew this question was going to come up. So uh, uh, you can do uh, everything that we have. If, if the original data set had cerebellum, uh, we include it. For PET, that's not always the case because what you don't, we have the cerebellum, but you don't want to use the cerebellum because for PET, a lot of the times, um, for different tracers, they're being referenced to the cerebellum. That's like the common preprocessing step. Um, and then you'd have to work just in, 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 in volume space, obviously, for cerebellum and for subcortex. Um, so, you know, a lot of the stuff of going to the surface uh, wouldn't, wouldn't work. But uh, other than that, uh, the, we do everything that I've shown you. If the original data set included uh, subcortex or cerebellum, it's there. Uh, you know, that's a great question. One thing that we never did, we should, probably should have done, is just that we, we, do, we did have some age distributions. We could have just plotted, you know. Um, so uh, we don't really know. Um, in the, I'd say the literature is a bit mixed. Um, so, yeah, what we do know is that they're uh, stable, uh, fairly stable across individuals. We looked a lot at the, at, at the individuals. Um, we also know that in, in a lot of cases, there, were, there, there, be, there would be, not a lot, but there were several instances where for a particular receptor, there were two, sometimes even three ways to measure its density, as in two different radio ligands. And then for one of them, sometimes, oftentimes, people would have this autoradiography enhanced version. So ultimately three. And there was always like really good correspondence among those. But no, we don't really know um, across age. I mean, all those uh, data like that exists, right? It's just that, again, in PET, the, because it's so expensive and you know, labor intensive as well, and um, that the data sets are typically quite small. So I think it would be, it would take like a lot of work to really build a, a normative lifespan um, sample, but definitely worth doing. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, so I, I don't, uh, yeah, you might think that, but then what we've seen time and time again, this is like a kind of a broader point, um, some of these things like that famous Margulis unimodal transmodal gradient doesn't change that much across individuals. You always find it. Um, and, 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 and that's actually a gradient that's uh, in some way a cousin, a distant macroscale cousin of this. It's, uh, you know, how similar are the underlying circuit configurations on one pole versus another pole. Um, so um, I, it's a new tracer also, so people have only just started to use it. I mean, um, so I, I, I think time will tell whether it's stable or unstable, but uh, that's, that's a great point. I actually never thought about that. Um, Uh, you know, uh, we don't really know. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure I could dig through the literature and find some tangential reason, but uh, the, the honest answer is we don't really know. What we found was that in the, in the autoradiography replication, um, the, uh, well, I should know, let, let, me, let me take that back for a second. Um, the, the receptor maps actually do a lot better at predicting the MEG power than they do a lot of other features of activity 
in, that you would get from resting state time series, resting state fMRI, fMRI bold time series. So they tend to do a little bit better for faster dynamics in general. Um, and then what we found was that same kind of uh, uh, behavior was in the in the auto radiography as well. But why that happens, I, I don't really know. It it could have something to do. You know, there there's there are other things that we're missing that we're bl completely blind to, like cell types in which this is being expressed and the type of circuit configurations that they're part of and so on. So, but yeah, good. It would be something to pursue in the future. I have a comment about the depression part because I remember, I, I, didn't, I don't actually remember the paper that I read a little, uh, some time ago, but there was a paper about uh, disproving this in, uh, serotonin imbalance in depression. Okay. I don't really remember exactly what it said, yeah. but uh, apparently uh, it doesn't have to do with serotonin at, at all. Uh, uh -huh. At least, uh, so I guess what I remember. But, but Why do SSRIs work? Sorry. Why do SSRIs work? Uh, that's the question, right? Okay. Uh, but it's a different question. So maybe that's related to that. I mean, maybe yeah, it could, yeah, it could be. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, that, that, that's what we find is that it's, it's such a complex system that we're studying that uh, frequently um, there could be things that were overlooked or misinterpreted given too much credit, too much importance. Yeah. yeah. It was a big paper, but I don't remember. I don't know if anyone else read it, but yeah, I'll, I'll send okay. it. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Here. Yes. Thank you for your talk. It was great. Can you go back a uh, lot of slides? <laughs> <laughs> Which one? Slides. Uh, I don't know. Where you show the connectivity, the structural connectivity and the functional connectivity oh, yeah. with your receptor density? Yeah. There. So, yeah. in the inferior right corner, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you show that you have a better correlation with the functional connectivity, right? Yeah. So, I was wondering well, if... Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's better than uh, the structural yeah. connectivity. Yeah, the one thing to keep in mind, though, yep. is that the structural connectivity only includes those connections that are actually... ...really recovered from diffusion MRI. Oh, okay. So, it's, it's, it's a subset connections. Okay, so I yeah. was wondering if uh, this explains better the functional connectivity. What if the functional connectivity we are measuring is explained by the receptor profile rather than the connectivity along time between these two, any structure? Yeah, to an extent, for sure. Yeah. Okay. That could de yeah, that, that could definitely be a part of it. And they're both explained by spatial proximity. <laughs> That's the other thing, right? And that's why we take such great care to control for that. Um, so everything that you're seeing on that side is is either regressing out proximity or using these spin tests and so on. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah, we're actually doing a, a study right now where we're looking at uh, all the different ways that you could do interregional similarity. So using uh, metabolic connectivity, receptor similar in gene correlated gene expression, structural functional connectivity synchrony and so on and we're benchmarking them and comparing them to see exactly what's more fundamental uh, yeah. oh, yeah. I, I think so, yeah, yeah. That one, one, and the other one is like, I know we all tend to think about the cortex and cortical uh, like functions, and like, can you mention what happened with the cortex, no? Yeah. And I see this, it's impressive, it's great, but we have the brain stem that is like yeah. very, really like, uh, we Understood. have like graphene nuclei, okay, and now which is the neurotransmitter, and now it's hard to imagine, but then it's like a kind of a gold standard that might be a good start. Yeah, a hundred percent. The you know actually the the reason we did the study in the first place is because we were really interested in this part, and uh, 
to do this part, you know, with uh, structural connectivity, for instance, even functional connectivity to some extent, we didn't really want to go into the brainstem. Uh, we don't. We don't know how to parcelate it. We don't. Maybe Luis, you can <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong. We don't know how to. You know. Uh, you know. We're, we're not sure how much we trust the uh, tractography reconstructions in brainstem. Um, so uh, that, that's why we kind of stopped short there. But that's that's the dream. Uh, is to. Yeah. Uh, oh, so if you look at it on BioArchive, the initial the initial submission is uh, actually not even HCP. It's DSI data from Patrick Hogman. Seventy subjects, DSI processed in DSI Studio, deterministic. And then um, on the advice of the reviewers, which I actually think was a great idea, we just went and did HCP for everybody. That's what you're seeing right now. Um, HCP uh, probabilistic with uh, with MR tricks actually. All right, I think uh, that's cool. All right, great. Uh, thank you so much.